Hey, good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for being part of our online service today. We just really appreciate all of you who are checking in week after week with our service and continuing to support us with your prayers and encouragement. It means a lot to us. Well, today we're back in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I want you to take your Bible, open it up, and find it if you would. Because what we're coming to today is a passage where the Apostle Paul is writing words of encouragement and also sharing his heart with these new believers in Thessalonians that he had been torn away from by persecution. You know, when you join a fellowship of people who are committed to Christ, you get to share first your relationship, your love for Jesus with these other believers, but then you also get to experience both the highs and the lows of life. Well, the lows of life come, uh, come on strong right here in Thessalonians because Paul is talking to them about the persecution that they have faced as other believers have, but he also shares with them the great joy and hope and encouragement that these new believers give the Apostle Paul whenever he thinks about them. So that's where we're at today. Our passage is uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, and our title is Pain and Joy. It says this, Therefore we never stop thanking God that when you received His message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very Word of God, which of course it is, and this Word continues to work in you who believe. And then, dear brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. In this way, you imitated the believers in God's churches in Judea, who, because of their belief in Christ Jesus, suffered from their own people, the Jews. <coughs> For some of the Jews killed the prophets, and some even killed the Lord Jesus. And now they have persecuted us too. They fail to please God, they work against all humanity as they try to keep us from preaching the good news of salvation to the Gentiles. And by doing this, they continue to pile up their sins, but the anger of God has caught up with them at last. Dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while, though our hearts never left you, we tried very hard to come back <coughs> because of our intense longing to see you again. We wanted very much to come to you. And I, Paul, tried again and again, but Satan prevented us. After all, what gives us hope and joy and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? It is you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this day, uh, we just want to thank you for the rain that you've sent to renew the earth, uh, to turn this part of the world from brown to green and uh, cause all things of spring to come to life. And Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit comes in the same way to refresh and renew us. Uh, we go through seasons of testing and trial and discouragement and weariness. And yet, Lord, you are the one who loves us and cares for us and by your Holy Spirit, continues to renew us from within. So Lord, would you take this word that we read today and use it to shape how we think, how we act, what we say, and how we live together as followers of Jesus Christ. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. So church, the question today is really, what is church all about? Um, we've said it many times, it's not just about a building, it's not just about a series of activities or programs or services, but a fellowship of believers is a group of people who have committed themselves to the gospel of Jesus Christ and being changed by the word of God. And that's what had happened with these Thessalonians. When they heard the good news from Paul, they knew that God was speaking to them and their hearts were warm to put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And in that, they became this community of people who were loved by God and learning to love God back by loving each other. Well, when you're part of a fellowship, uh, you share things in common. That's what fellowship means. It's what we share. It's what we experience together. And uh, frequently when we think of fellowship, we think of food, of sitting down at a table and sharing a meal together. And that's a great way to experience fellowship. 
But fellowship at the deepest level goes far beyond a meal. It means sharing both the highest uh, good times in life and also the toughest, darkest times in life. And both of those were being experienced by these Thessalonian believers. Now, <clears throat> from, uh, from our verses here, one of the things that these folks had experienced was the pain of persecution. In their commitment to Jesus Christ, they had experienced a portion of the resistance and rejection that the world gave to the Lord Jesus. So here Paul talks about them in verse 14. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. In this way, you imitated the believers in God's churches in Judea, who because of their belief in Christ Jesus, suffered from their own people, the Jews. Now, earlier in the letter, Paul had already said that in their experience of suffering, they had um, imitated Paul. And in doing that, they had also imitated what Christ had suffered. And now he is drawing a parallel between their experience in this Greek city, hundreds of miles away from Israel, and the experience of those first Jewish believers who had committed themselves to Christ, um, in many cases years, even almost two decades earlier, but had suffered the same type of persecution and rejection. So you can picture uh, new believers being uh, threatened by maybe family members and friends or estranged from people um, in their own family. Um, in a prosperous, influential city like Thessalonica, it would be very easy to imagine um, respectable families finding it absolutely shameful that one of their own would commit themselves to a crucified Jew named Jesus Christ. Many would face financial hardships if they were driven from their home or driven from their workplace. Many of the trade guilds in that city were connected to worshiping pagan gods and having festivals in pagan temples. And this would upend the livelihood of those Christians who were in those vocations. If you worked as a government official or a soldier, you were expected to give your full and highest allegiance to Caesar, the emperor. And for many people, they saw Caesar as almost a god on earth. They would refer to Caesar as Savior and Lord. Well, if you came into the office and somebody cornered you and you said that Jesus is Savior and Lord, what kind of ramifications would that have for your life? It would totally turn your world upside down. Those were the kind of experiences that these believers were facing in a fellowship of pain that they shared in common with other believers in other sittings going all the way back to Israel when those first uh, Jewish converts to Jesus Christ experienced the same thing from their countrymen. This commitment to Christ meant that they shared a portion of the trouble that the world gave Christ, that it would overflow and affect them as followers of Jesus. Now, when we think about Christian persecution, this is not just something that's far away. Uh, back in Bible times. The people who track these things tell us that there are more Christians facing persecution today than at any time in world history. Uh, the ministry Open Doors lists 340 million followers of Jesus live in countries where they face a high level of persecution for their faith. In the last year, uh, across many nations, 4,500 churches or Christian organizations were attacked or vandalized. 4,700 Christians were put to death for their faith, and thousands more wait under arrest, often without trial. Uh, in our own nation, there is great concern about what is the future of Christian organizations like colleges, ministries, nonprofit, charitable organizations, if they do not fully embrace an LGBT affirming agenda. Uh, will we be allowed to continue to practice and maintain our convictions around human sexuality and marriage? Or will we face corporate and government harassment and lawsuits? Uh, if you've never heard of the Equality Act being brought before Congress, uh, it is an act that would seek to basically suspend or overturn religious freedoms in order to forward a mandatory acceptance of an LGBT agenda. So to see what's at stake, uh, there are some great articles on this issue on our uh, free church website, efca.org, 
or the National Association of Evangelicals, NAE website, or at the Gospel Coalition website. But these are things that the church in America is facing, and we don't know what the future holds. But what we do know is this. When we face alienation from family or friends, when we feel like we're an outsider in our own work environment, when we wonder what the future is going to hold, um, that is not an uncommon Christian experience. That is part of the Christian experience in our fellowship with Jesus Christ and with one another. Jesus said that in this world we would face trouble, but he said, take heart. I have overcome the world. Don't be discouraged. For many of us, the troubles that we face might not be persecution related at all, but there'll be other things that wear us down, things that give us a heavy heart. Uh, for some, it's the uh, pain of losing a loved one or health trouble or facing mental health challenges or having troubles in our family relationships. The church is meant to be the fellowship where those who love Jesus Christ come together to love one another and carry one another's burdens and pray for one another and encourage each other in our faith when we face seasons of hardship. And that's what these young believers were facing. Paul wanted to be there in person. Paul wanted to be able to continue to nurture and teach and encourage them in their faith, but persecution had driven him away. And so here through this word, Paul wanted to build their faith and give them guidance and encourage them that they were not alone, but that God was still at work in their midst. Now, some will look at Paul's words here in verse 15 and 16, and they are really hot and strong. And some will even ask, man, is, is the Apostle Paul anti-Jewish? Listen to what he says here. Uh, verse 15, for some of the Jews killed the prophets, and some even killed the Lord Jesus. And now they persecute us too. They fail to please God. They work against all humanity as they try to keep us from preaching the good news of salvation to the Gentiles. By doing this, they continue to pile up their sins, but the anger of God has caught up with them at last. Now, those are pretty strong, pretty hot words, but you need to take them in context. Paul himself is a Jewish man. All of his friends and family are Jewish. All the first believers were Jewish. He preaches a Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is Jewish. Uh, in every new city that Paul visited, he always went to the Jewish synagogue first. If you want Paul's full perspective on how he sees and understands and thinks and how he feels about and loves his own Jewish people, Romans 9, 10, and 11, uh, Paul spells it out in much further detail here. But understand <coughs> that Paul had suffered greatly. And in his suffering, so many times it came from his own people. And as he writes about these Jewish leaders, this is not a, a blanket denunciation of all Jews everywhere, but of the Jewish leaders who over centuries had killed prophets that God had sent, had turned Jesus over to Pilate to be killed, and now we're trying to stop Paul and others from bringing the gospel to Gentiles. Um, Paul was once one of that group. Uh, Paul was an insider at, before his conversion to Christ. Paul was one of those uh, leaders in the Jewish community who had fought so hard to bring Christianity to an end. He was one who was there when uh, uh, Stephen was stoned. He was one who was there as people were dragging new believers off to jail. So when he writes this uh, denunciation and these charges, he writes as one who had fully been an insider in that community that sought to persecute the new followers of Jesus. So understand also <laughs> that Paul has been chased and run out of Jerusalem, Antioch, Damascus, Iconium, Lystra, and Thessalonica. He has been beaten and mobbed and dragged to court and thrown in jail and left for dead. So how do you not give up? How do you not quit? Obviously, he has a lot of uh, pain and hurt that he has experienced at the hands of his own people, as these new Thessalonian believers have had. And yet he entrusts himself and his own future 
to the care and grace of God. But he also recognizes that his opponents who are after him, they are also going to stand before God. Um, they are not going to get away with anything in the end. He says, they have been trying to keep us from preaching the good news of salvation to the Gentiles. And by doing this, they continue to pile up their sins. But the anger of God has caught up with them at last. Um, Paul's enemies will stand before God. And folks, if you have people who are persecuting you, who make your life hard, difficult, miserable, who intentionally try to harm or uh, malign you, um, Jesus says, pray for them. Jesus says, don't strike back and lash out at them, but rather love them because these are people who are standing under God's judgment as it is. And Paul recognizes that these folks in the end are going to escape with nothing. If they don't come to Christ, they will face the penalty of their own sins. <clears throat> and so, moving on, verse 17, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while, though our hearts never left you, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. We wanted very much to come to you. And I, Paul, tried again and again, but Satan prevented us. Folks, when I read through those verses, I can't help but thinking of the last year that we've had going through this pandemic together. Uh, people have been isolated. People have been separated. Uh, people have been lonely. People have been longing to see each other. Um, they were separated by persecution, and yet Paul says our heart was still with you, and we tried hard to come back. And, uh, and, and he says Satan prevented them. Now, we'd love for him to explain. Saul, what did that mean? Paul, what was going on? Does he mean that's a reference to the city leaders who wouldn't allow them to return? Does that mean that he was facing some other uh, type of medical or financial trial that prevented him from coming back? We don't know. He doesn't spell it out. But in the, in the resistance that Paul faced in returning to these believers and his inability to get back to them, he saw the hand of his adversary, Satan the devil. Now, folks, when you think of Satan, don't think of uh, some silly cartoon of a guy in a red suit, horns and a pitchfork. But there is a spiritual presence of evil that resists God, that lies to us, that seeks to destroy everything that God wants to do in our lives. And through this year, um, not only have we experienced the physical separation that's brought about by COVID and shutdowns, and, uh, and all the difficult decisions that we've had to face. But there is a spiritual oppression that is part of all this. Our enemy, Satan, is seeking to divide and destroy and, and, um, and do everything that he can to steal our joy and to steal our contentment and to break down our unity. So Paul, recognizing all this, just shares his heart. Hey, we wanted to be with you. And folks, I want to say that to you today, man. This has been a hard year for the church. It's been hard for many of us in different kinds of ways. But the separation, uh, the distance, um, man, we've tried to overcome it with things like phone calls and Zoom meetings and online church services and all this. But there's no substitute for being together in person. There's no substitute for being able to to hug each other and see each other and sit in the same room across from the same table. Folks, that's what we're longing for. And we continue to pray that God would give us grace and guidance and unity and a sense of peace as we move forward, as we slowly work our way back to that thing we called normal before COVID. But in the meantime, I want you to see what Paul does here as we wrap up this section today. Verse 19. This is what he says about these young believers that he had a very limited amount of time with, but that he cared very much for. He said, after all, what gives us hope and joy? And what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? It's you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. Uh, they had been... <coughs> Torn apart, the word that Paul uses there uh, earlier when he talks about them being separated. He said it's like we were orphaned, like a family torn apart. 
But he says, when we think about you, how do we think about you? What do you mean to us? What gives us hope? Well, in these young believers, Paul's confidence in what God was able to do was built up and stirred up. And he could see that when people responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit came into their life and they began to learn from the word how to walk in God's ways and they were part of this fellowship that was building up their faith, he could see the life change happening in them. And folks, nothing fills the hope, uh, the heart of a believer so much as seeing a new believer take those first baby steps in the faith and begin to grow in their knowledge of God and in their love for people and in, and in yielding themselves to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That stirs the hope in all of us. And joy. Uh, folks, there are so many places that we can look to for joy. And so many times they're temporary. It might be a hobby. It might be um, you know, success in our workplace. It might be a recreation or taking a trip. And so many of these are so short lasting. But Paul had an abiding sense of joy from his relationship with these believers. Now, he'd only had a limited time with them, but their faith in Christ was genuine and his connection to them was real. And when he thought about them, he prayed with gratitude and when he thought about them, he put a smile on his face that came from a smile in his heart because he could see in their lives the grace of God at work. And he knew that he got to be a part of that, that he had a significant impact in the lives of these young believers. And that brought great joy to him. So what is he says, what will be our proud reward and our crown when we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? What is Paul looking forward to? Paul is looking forward to the return of Christ. In Thessalonians, the return of Christ is never far from Paul's mind. And he does not look forward to that day with a sense of dread or fear, but a sense of great anticipation that he will be able to stand before the Lord and hear um, Jesus' commendation, well done, good and faithful servant, in what Paul has done in living his life for Christ and sharing the gospel with others. So he says, uh, what is going to be his crown when he stands before the Lord Jesus? Now, don't picture a big, heavy uh, metal crown of gold or silver like uh, would be on a king's head. He's not talking about nobility. The Greek word here is Stephanus, and that is the laurel wreath that would be placed on the head of an Olympic champion. So in Thessalonica, it's a Greek city and they're used to Greek games and competition. And if you were the competitor who ran the race well and, and won your event, this was a sign of your achievement and accomplishment that you were the victor, you had prevailed. And Paul, in his life, he is running a race. He is running a race to serve God and to reach people. And when he looks at this young church in Thessalonica, he sees the evidence that gives him great confidence of the joy and the satisfaction that he will have when he stands before the Lord Jesus Christ one day. He says, it is you. You are our pride and joy. Folks, it's been a challenging year. It's been a hard year in many ways. We've been separated, um, distance due to COVID and all things related to it. But as we gradually work our way back into a thing called normal, would you take some time to ask yourself, what is it that you want to invest yourself in? What is it that you want to give yourself to? We all have jobs to take care of. We have family needs. We have our health to take care of. But what is it that energizes you when you think about your love for the Lord and your service to Him? Can I just encourage you to invest yourself in people, in loving them, in praying for them, encouraging them, whether they're people you've known a long time and who've walked with the Lord a long time, or whether they're new believers, or maybe they're believers in your own church and you just haven't gotten to know them yet. Can I encourage you to do what Paul did, to invest yourself in people. 
both those who are already mature in Christ, those who are young in the faith and growing in Christ, and those who still need to know Christ. Because there will be a day, friends, when you and I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and we get to lay out what we have done with our lives before him. And we want to do in our life now what matters to Jesus Christ and nothing matters more to him than people for whom he died and the glory of God our Father that we live for. Take time and tell the people in your life what they mean to you. Uh, is there a person in your life, a family, a friend, a, a fellow believer at your church who brings you great joy? Tell them that. Is there a friend or a family member or somebody in your church who inspires you with hope when you see what God has done? Tell them that. Not only is it going to be good for you, it's going to be good for them, and it's going to honor the Lord Jesus Christ as we build each other up. When you think about what it means to stand before the Lord, are there people that you need to thank because of the impact they've had on your life? Are there people who've invested in you the way that Paul invested in these folks? Put that to words. Let people know. In everything that we've been through over the last year, uh, being separated, um, facing all kinds of tough decisions, many times feeling like the church is uh, divided and the decisions that we ought to make, this is a great time to be a person of encouragement, to be a person who is able to put into words your, your thoughts, your feelings, your love for the people that God has put around you. Invest yourself in people. Invest yourself in the work of God. Invest yourself in telling people what they mean to you and how um, they have brought joy and hope and encouragement and uh, great anticipation into your life through what God has done in theirs. Would you join me for prayer? And then we'll be wrapping up today with a closing song and a benediction. Let's pray. Uh, Father, uh, there are days when the challenges that we face in this life just seem overwhelming. And yet, Jesus, you have overcome. You have overcome death and the grave. You have overcome our sin. You have overcome this world. And Lord, you've put your spirit in us so that we can have your peace and your joy and your power at work in our lives. Lord, this day, would you renew our spirit so that we can face with strength and with hope any trouble that we must endure, any trials that we have to go through. But Lord, may we also look and see where you've been at work in our lives and in the lives of people around us. And may we be ready to give thanks to God for what you've done and be ready to share with others the joy and gratitude that they brought to our hearts. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you soon for benediction.